turning in our Bibles this morning to Luke chapter number 5 and verse number 1. Now, we want everyone to feel welcome here, but we want the Lord to know he is welcome in this place forevermore. Say amen to that. And if you're watching online, God bless you. Luke chapter number 5 and verse number 1. And when you find it, if you will, stand to your feet for the reading of the Word of God this morning. Luke chapter 5 and verse number 1. Luke 5 and 1. I'm going to read a familiar text to you today. Luke 5 and 1 starts off and it reads this way. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them. And what were they doing? They were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. Now, if you're following along reading this morning, I want you to pay very close attention to verse number 5 with me. The Bible said, And Simon answering said unto him, Master, I want you to say this part with me. We have toiled all the night. Say that with me again. We have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Boy, that just strikes you deep, don't it? Nothing. You know where I come from, nothing means nothing. It don't mean a couple, a few. It means zero, nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word... I will let down the net. Now, we've pointed this out many times in the past in preaching, and I'm sure you've probably heard another preacher maybe make mention of this, but the Lord didn't tell him to let down a net. He said nets, plural. But whenever the man of God says he will nevertheless do it, he says, nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let down the net. Now, in verse number Verse number 7 or 6, when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net brake, and they beckoned unto their partners which were in the other ship that they should come and help them, and they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He realized his lack of faith right away and his doubt. Verse number 9, for he was astonished and all that were with him at the drought of fishes which they had taken. With the Lord's help this morning, this is something God impressed on my heart a few days ago, and I've been, I guess you'd say, mulling this idea, this thought, this verse, and this passage here in my head for days. But this is what the Lord dealt with me to preach on, something from a place of nothing. Something from a place of nothing. Will you stretch your hand to the Lord with me, and let's join in concert prayer. Father, this morning we understand our great need for your help and strength and grace, mercy to be applied to every need in this sanctuary. I pray, God, for the next few moments that you will take the word of God, use it to speak directly to our hearts. I pray, God, as a minister of the gospel, make me as a minister as a flame of fire. God, to preach and say the very things that you would have me to say, nothing more and nothing less. Let the conviction of the Holy Ghost be in this house. Deal with those that are watching online and those that are listening here as well. And we'll give you praise for every good thing that is accomplished in the name of Jesus. Everyone can say amen this morning. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As I get ready to preach this to you, I want you to understand that this is a very sobering message and it is a very serious thought. And when I began to pray over this and God dealt with me, 
so deeply about this subject, I began to understand that this is a message that if you're a preacher, if you're a leader, if you're somebody that is any form of ministry, that this is something that God can use to talk directly to you in a very unique way because I believe there are a lot of things that we have faced that we'll read about in this text and we'll begin to understand from the text. I also believe this morning that if you've been in this race for any length of time and you've been serving God with all of your heart, you've been going after it with everything you have, and there are times that you feel like that you've come up empty-handed or times that you have struggled and you say, God, why are we in the place that we're in? I believe that God will talk to you this morning about this very thought when something or something from a place of nothing you see, I don't believe with the, I don't believe at all that there's too many places that we can get into, areas of our life that are not any more discouraging than for us to put forth an incredible effort only to come back with zero results. I heard, I had a preacher tell me years ago something that as we were talking about Sister Jackson made mention of this in Sunday school this morning that there are things that may be said to us or things that happen that stick with us for years. And I remember that a preacher told me many years ago, he said that he had gone on a fast and he had prayed and sought the Lord for 40 days, gone on a 40-day fast. And you know, if you're probably like myself, when you're listening to somebody tell you they went on a 40-day fast, seeking God for revival, seeking God for a breakthrough in their church, you're sitting on the other end of that conversation and the thing you're listening for, you're expecting to hear is what great breakthrough took place whenever the 40-day fast was over with because, I mean, if you've put forth that kind of sacrifice, apparent, evidently you're expecting something great to come out of that. If you've fasted and sought God, you're, you're doing it for some reason. You're looking forward to what God's going to do because you know that great things come from many great sacrifices that we make. But as I listened to this preacher explain to me all that was going on, he had trouble in his church and problems that he was facing and all these different onslaughts of the enemy that he, the enemy was coming against him with and he began to seek God, went on a 40-day fast. I asked him the question, I said, at the end of the 40-day fast, what happened? He said, nothing. Nothing. Oh, nothing is discouraging. When you put forth, and now when he explained this to me, don't, don't take it away and think that God didn't honor his sacrifice. I don't believe that was it. But the very thing that he was looking for, the change that he was hoping for, nothing. It didn't turn out the way he was expecting. It didn't happen the way that he thought it was going to. And I couldn't help but to think about the many areas of ministry that myself that I've been in over the years where that I put forth this incredible effort. Has anybody ever done that? I mean, you're working like you, uh, you're putting in overtime and you're trying, and all of a sudden you find out, I can't even hardly, why, why can't I pay the electric bill this month? I mean, I, I work the overtime and at the end of the month, I still have bills that I can't, I mean, what more do I got to do? And it still seems like I'm coming up empty handed. If you ever been there, shout out to me and say, I've been there. But you see, when I think about the many facets of life, it would be like this morning a college student going to college for four years, putting in all the hard work, the homework, the payments, maybe even owing the college or whatever, this big money, this big amount of money that because of all their tuitions and everything, and then when it was all over with, they can't even get a job in the, in the line of work that they went to college for. Don't tell me that is not discouraging. That would be like a, a, a teacher who's got a class of students, and you spend an entire year trying to help those young children learn the basics of math and English and science and whatever else. And at the end of the year, every single one of the children in your class 
fail the class. Don't tell me that wouldn't be discouraging this morning. That would be like somebody that's a coach and you've spent countless hours with the team. You've been at every practice. You've been out there in the hot sun. You've sacked every everything you can sack. You've thrown all the passes you can throw. You've done everything that you can within your ability and power. But at the end of the day, and the season's end, you haven't won not one single game. Don't tell me that wouldn't be discouraging. I'll tell you this morning, there are things in this life that are just like that. We're going to face offsets. We're going to face upsets. We're going to face setbacks. And I'll tell you, the devil has a heyday. Every time that we have a setback, the enemy just sits back and he looks at you and he's just like, see, you're not going anywhere. See, nothing's going to happen good for you. You're not going. You're a nobody. God's not hearing your prayer. Have you ever heard the devil tell you that or come across like that? But you see, the reality is uh, that sometimes life is going to be just like that. If you've ever sat down and played a game of cards and you look down at your hand and you don't want to call a bluff, you don't want to act like that you got a terrible hand, but you're looking at the hand of cards and you're thinking to yourself, what am I supposed to do with this? I mean, I, I mean, this is terrible. Man, if I only had her hand or if I only had his hand, if I had their hand, let me tell you in the great scope of things, when it comes to God, all we need is his hand. Say amen to me here this morning. All we need is the Lord's hand. We don't need another church, another preacher, or somebody else's hand. What we need is the hand of God in the midst of what we are facing and what we are going through. You see, if you're a fisherman and you go out and you toil and you fish, the logic behind most fishermen is if you spend a long time in the same place, hours upon hours, you've baited the hook right you tried every lure in the box uh, and you tried everything you can think of and you still have not caught one fish and you still haven't got one bite. Amen. The logic behind that, behind the average fisherman is uh, there are no fish here and it's time for me to move on uh, and it's time for me to try something different and sometimes that is the case. Uh, But I'm afraid this morning uh, that sometimes we are in a place of our life uh, that we feel like it's time to pack up the net. Sometimes we feel like it's time to clean off the net and put it on a shelf and call it a day. Have you ever been there before? Have you ever felt like I just cannot take another minute of this right here? There has got to be something better than where I am right now. There's got to be a better way than this. I cannot deal with this another day. Now, if I'm not talking to you, then maybe this don't matter to you at all. But there are some of us here this morning uh, that can perfectly relate to what I'm saying. You get to those places like dear God, if another thing goes wrong, I mean I can't quite get a leg up. It seemed like I looked to the left and it seemed like this brother over here or that sister over there, they seem to be doing so much better and I'm giving it everything I've got. It's not like I haven't toiled all night. It's not like I'm not trying to get a job. It's not like I'm not trying to pay my bills. Uh, But I can't can't seem to get a leg up no matter how much I try. Have you ever been there? Say man. Because common sense will tell us if you're by the lakeside and you've tried every lure in the box and you've tried everything you can think of and you have sat there hour after hour and ain't nobody, not just you, but nobody else has caught anything. Common sense typically tells us something. There's no way that you're going to get something from nothing. There is no fish in this spot. There is nothing here. You can't get something out of nothing. I mean, science will tell you, you cannot take something out of nothing. And if there ain't nothing there, if there is absolutely no fish in the water, you might as well, amen, pull up stakes, uh, float the boat to the shore, pack up your net, and go somewhere else. Uh, But I came to tell somebody this morning that while I was praying, talking to the Lord this morning, that God sent me here to tell you don't pack your net up just yet you need to give it one more shot let God work one more time let God show you that he is the way maker he's the difference in the problem he is the equation that you've been looking for you just gotta trust God say amen somebody I want you to look at this text today in this particular text 
they have cast out their net so many times. I want you to understand that casting out a net is not an easy thing. Anybody ever cast a net before? Caraway. He does a lot of uh, net casting. One day, Brother Josh told me, he said, this is how you cast the net. He was trying to show me how that all the weights on the end of the, man, I'm telling you, I'd have had a net wrapped around everything. It ain't as easy to cast and throw it just right as you may think that it is. But those weights that are on the end of that net that help that net carry to the bottom of the, the, the ocean or the water, That is meant for a purpose, but that gets heavy. You can lift a a 12-ounce can of Coke enough times that after a while, it'll start getting heavy. But I want you to imagine here with you, with your mind for a minute, that you're out on the water and you're in this vessel, this boat, and you have cast this net out all night long. I mean, that's a lot of net casting. You have thrown that net repeatedly over and over and over. I have put forth so much effort. I can tell you I tried it over here. I tried it out there and I tried it back there and I just can't seem to get anything in this net. Maybe there's something wrong with the net. Maybe I went during the wrong time of the day. There's a lot of things that begin to go through your mind when you've been out there all night long throwing that net, giving it everything you got and you're still coming up in empty handed but I want you to see that they not only cast that net out all night long but they were either they had either come to a place in their life that they were either fatigued they were severely fatigued or either they had come to the conclusion that there's nothing out here worth us carrying on for consider this for a moment they could possibly be so fatigued and so tired, man, I done cast that net out all night long. I can't even barely pick my arms up. You ever worked so hard that it was hard to pick your feet up walking in the door of the house? Huh? So tired that you felt like, man, I think what I'm going to do, I'm just going to fall in the bed. I'm just going to fall into the bed. I can't even hardly pick. My legs feel heavy. My arms feel heavy. If you ever seen these uh, fishermen that do a lot of net casting, a lot of times their forearms are huge. Anybody remember Popeye? Well, that's the whole principle behind it because if you got a lot of net casting to do, you're going to work those forearm muscles until you got some big forearms because you work so hard. But there comes a time that even a seasoned fisherman, I want you to understand, these are not just any run-of-the-mill people here. These are men that know how to fish. These are men that do do it all the time. And if you add to the equation the fact that these men are not out there in a bass tournament. Come on, they're not out there for pleasure. They're not out there because it's Saturday and they worked all week and they're going to take the boat out and make sure the water, the, the, the motor still runs good and, and the boat don't leak and I'm going to get my boat on the water. It wasn't like that. They lived off of what came into that boat. They were going to survive whether they sold it or whether they ate it. And if you didn't bring it in the boat, you didn't eat. If you didn't bring it in the boat, you had nothing to sell. If you got nothing to sell. You've got nothing to live off of. It is detrimental that they they bring something into that boat. I'll tell you, hey man, you want to talk about discouraging, have to walk through the front door and look at your wife and say, well honey, we didn't catch anything and know that if you didn't catch anything, little Johnny and little Susie didn't eat anything. So it adds a whole other layer to the problem to complicate the whole situation. But here they are on the water. They've cast the net all night long. And so Jesus is teaching along the shore and a crowd begins to gather that is so incredible that they begin to throng around Jesus and he can't quite get away from the people enough to even teach. While this is going on in the backdrop, I want you to see in your mind, here are some fishermen who are worn out There may have been some that have finally came to the conclusion, boys, let's just go in for the day. There's no sense in doing this anymore. I'm tired of doing the same old thing and getting nothing in return. In the background, 
If you've ever cast a net, you understand that rocks, garbage, and things get stuck and trapped and intertwined in that net. The Bible said they're over there, they're cleaning out their net. And if you get a visual of that, while Jesus is over here teaching and you got these men there cleaning out their nets, they're trying to get ready to take those nets, fold them up nice and neatly, and they're going to pack them up and put them away. To take that net and clean it means we're done. It was a lot of work. Whenever I'm on the job site and I get to the end of the day and I've worked all day long, I've been working on a chiropractor office over here in Apopka. And sometimes the most work you do is at the end of the day where you got to clean up, wrap up your extension cords, put all your tools away, put it in the truck and load up everything at the very end of the day. Now they have gone through all the motions. Uh, Brother Steve, you're a plumber. Come here for a second. Let me ask you a question. How would you feel if you had gone to somebody's house and you've been there all night long. And you're working on the plumbing and nothing you have on your truck can fix it. Nothing you have tried has fixed it. And it's almost like this is an absolute lost cause. I'm coming up empty handed. And you have went to the truck and you put every piece of pipe fitting and every piece of PVC, every tool, every tool bag, every drill, everything's packed in the truck. Somebody walks over and says, to head back in the house and try one more thing. Huh? I'm just making this real. Jesus launches out into this boat, Simon Peter's boat, right? Teaches them on the water. Whenever he comes back to the shore, He tells Peter, take this boat, launch back out into the water and cast out your nets for a drought of fish. Peter does the human thing. And I want you to bear in your mind just like if you were Peter. And Peter says, there ain't no telling what went through Peter's mind. Lord, now, just... I." I know you're God and you know everything, but I just want to remind you, okay, just so you, your memory's fresh, we have toiled, not we have just cast net, we have toiled. The original word for toil means it, it's an incredible labor. I mean, we have, we're, and it means fatigued. We, have, we are fatigued, we're worn out, we have, we're spent. We have toiled all night long and we ain't taking nothing. But nevertheless now, Lord, now your word Mm, we'll do this. Have you ever had a place of your life where that you were ready, you've done packed up your net, you've done quit, you've done resigned, you've done said, I forget it, I'm done, I'm through, it's over. And God comes along and says, unfold your net, nets. Take them out on that boat and do it one more time. And you're like, Lord, I've been teaching this class right here for the last three years. Nothing. And I've tried everything in my power, and I keep coming up empty-handed. I just want to remind you how much I've tried. I just want to remind you how nobody cares, and nobody's listening, and nobody wants to get with me. and nobody. You know, I just want to remind you of all this. And God says, go out there one more time. Do you know I had to, as I was getting ready this morning, I want to talk to you here. You can sit down, my brother. As I was getting ready for church this morning, I had to stop and pause, and I started thinking back, and it brought tears to my eyes. And I'm the type of pastor I don't try to hide or try to, uh, I don't try to simulate a lifestyle that I've never struggled, I've never had a problem, or I've never gone through a trouble or trial. I try to be transparent and real. And I, I began to think back this morning as God brought this message so vividly to my mind about things I personally have been through. Now, this ain't going to sound spiritual, but some of you will appreciate it because you can identify with what I'm saying. As I stood there this morning, I remembered a time when the church 
got to the point where it looked like the doors might even close. I don't know what's going to happen with this church. I mean, everything seems to be falling apart. This person ain't happy, that person ain't happy, and this one ain't happy, and, and it just seems like everything I'm trying to do, it just ain't working, and I've tried, and I've had people send me letters and criticize me. I've had people openly rebuke me and criticize me, and I just sit there and I thought to myself, that's it. I'm done. I'm not pastoring here anymore. I'll I'll find somewhere else to go. I'll make somebody a good church member. I went to my wife and I said, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this thing. And I said, you know, I'm just being open and honest with you. And I hope you can appreciate this. This is many years ago I went through this. And I told my wife, I said, this big building that is almost useless next door. I keep my building materials in this building for this line of work that I do. And if I'm not pastoring there, there's really no use or reason, rhyme, or for my things to be in there. And I said, so we're going to have to find us somewhere to put these things in storage. At the time, I didn't have a place at my house that would fit it. So I told my wife, I said, we're going to have to start getting stuff out of the building. We're going to have to start doing this. I had already started making plans. I'd already had everything laid out, what I was going to do, how I was going to do it. I already had it all in my mind. You know what I was doing? I was packing up my nets. I'd done everything I know to do. I mean, I've tried everything. I've implemented about every plan that I can think of. I'm done. Stick a fork in me. I'm done. You ever been there before? I don't know what else I can do. And I'd already started packing up my net. But God came along in the form of Sister Myers. And Sister Myers said, I think you better pray more about that before you make that decision. I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I sat down at my computer. I mean, I typed out a resignation letter the whole nine yards. I mean, I'm done. I just, I don't know what else. I can't help nobody. Ain't nobody happy. So I might as well find somewhere else to go. And uh, maybe just make somebody a good church member somewhere. And about that time, God began to deal with my heart. I began to pray and seek the Lord. And you know what God was trying to do? He's trying to tell me, get your net off the shelf. Get the net back out. But God, and I'm like, God, you already know what we're going through. We're three months behind on the mortgage payment. I mean, I don't know what else I can do. I can't make people pay their tithes. And I was struggling here, struggling there. I don't know what else to do. And I'm like Peter in a way. God, we have toiled all night long. We have put so much effort for, I don't know what else to do. I don't have everything I know to do. And God's like, mm-hmm, I'm hearing you. And I'm like, yes. I'll get up. And I'll preach one more sermon. God says, sermons. And I said, I'll preach one more sermon. Because the Lord said, let down your nets. And Peter says, I'll let down a net. Am I making it real enough for you? You ever been there before? Well, I'll do just a little. I'll, you know, I'm going to prove to God that this is not going to work. Because I've tried it so many times. How in the world do you get something out of nothing? I mean, I mean, what are you supposed to do? I mean, one day we get a letter that somebody shoved through the door. I didn't even know what it was. It wasn't even certified. It said that they were taking this property, the whole entire church property, to a tax deed auction for something that happened before I even came here to pastor. And when they got a new uh, whatever somebody elected in the, in the office here local, that they went through the books and started going back and charging people stuff for they owed. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, they're getting ready to take the whole entire property to a tax deed auction over $300 or $500. And when they added this year's tax to it, it made it like, I think, $1,800. Here we are. We've lost an associate pastor. We've lost this and tithes and all for it. Brother Clarity had passed away. Amen. The morale of the church was down. Everybody seemed unhappy. And I said, God, it's just one more nail in the coffin. I've cast the net out. What else am I supposed to do? And if that wasn't enough, 
I got a phone call. Pastor Myers? Yes. This is Wilma Miller. And um, I know you guys are doing the best you can over there. But your insurance has lapsed. And your carrier is going to cancel the policy. And if they cancel the policy... For you to find insurance with somebody else, you'll be at a rate about three to five times higher than you are now. If it wasn't one thing, it was another. And it looked so inevitable. It looked like there was absolute... Am I okay preaching this to you? It looked like there was no way out. No other choice. But I put my best foot forward. There were times I got up to preach about the fire whenever I was doing the best I could to blow on the little fire inside of me. There were times I'd get up and talk about faith when I was doing the best I could to keep my own faith. Am I still preaching to you? Huh? But I, but I got a call from the heaven above that God was essentially saying, son, get your net out. But God, do you understand that if I get my net out and I take it out there and I throw it in the water, I got to clean it again. We're done for the day. I've already made plans. Well, some of you may have already made plans, but the reason why your plans ain't going nowhere because God said, I'm not done. Now, if you want to quit on me, that's your, your decision and you will reap the rewards of that decision. But sometimes you got to open up your own eyes and say, God's not always working it in just the natural things we see with our eyes. We serve a God who that we worship in spirit and in truth and he's doing things behind the scenes, working on stuff you don't have no idea about. Within a couple of months time, God took all of that incredibly upside down how we going to take and make something out of nothing and turned it around for his glory. Now, who but God? You can blame it. You can, you can say all kinds of things. Well, it's this, it's that, it's the other. But how many of you have ever had a God moment where you knew that if it wasn't God, it wouldn't have never happened? Huh? Historically, they say that the wording here says ship, that the likelihood was because of the location that the word ship may imply to you some gigantic vessel. But in reality, when they use the word ship, it simply meant a small vessel or a boat that was on the water. And I heard one preacher preach it I mean, several years ago, and I want to interject it here this morning. He said that historically, that those boats were only about six foot wide. That means that whenever he said cast it on that side uh, is it possible that all night long you've been casting it over there and you're six foot from the will of God all night long you've been putting it over here God said you've been six foot have you been that close have you really been that close to having your breakthrough just that close to having the answer that God has for you somebody say amen some of y'all are looking at me awful blank this morning. I want you to know what I preached about happened several years ago. I didn't just get up here and tell you I'm fixing to leave. I'm just telling you the way it was back when. But whenever they get tired and they get fatigued and they've worked all night and nothing is a result or you feel like it's nothing, you see, you have to consider. And this is, this is like my grandmother used to have cows. And she told me and my wife, she said, that cream on the top of that milk, that's the best part. Huh? That's what Granny said. I wasn't raised on that kind of milk, and though it may taste better to some people, I just couldn't handle the blood vessels and all that other stuff that I saw in it. But you know what I mean. But this part of this that God showed me is like that cream on the top. It's like that whipped topping. What is that? The one thing that changed the dynamic to this whole story, it wasn't just, well, let me throw it one more time because they had already done all that. 
He said, nevertheless, at thy, nevertheless, at thy, thy word. Let me tell you the reason why that we quit a lot of times before we should because we didn't get a lot of times we throw up our hands because we weren't willing to get a. All it took was for the master to give the word. You see, if you and I will stay down in an altar of prayer and we'll seek God with every fiber of our soul until we get a word from God, I believe within my heart that based on what God showed me here and what I have experienced in my own childlike faith and experience in the Lord, that if I'll get down in a place by myself, sometimes you gotta steal away, turn off the phone, turn off the lights, get in someplace all by yourself, get down on your face and say, God, before I put my net all the way up, before I put it on the shelf, before I pack it up, before I clean it up, I need to get a word because, honey, you can't go on a lot of stuff. You know, Fred next door might say, buddy, we've been here all night, there ain't no fish, you might as well go home. And if you go on Fred's word, you might miss God. But if you stay until you get a word from God, I said, and see if you stay until you get a fresh word from God, you can stand on that. When the earth falls apart, amen, whenever the earth melts with fervent heat, you'll still be able to stand on the word of God. The Bible said the flower uh, withereth, uh, grass, grass withered and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God will stand forever. You can stand on a word. That's where some of you are right now is you need a word. You can kick the can down the street and keep fussing about your problems and keep complaining about your circumstances and the way things are and be the most miserable person on the whole planet. Go ahead, throw up your hands and quit and say, forget it, I'm not going any farther than right here. I'm done, stick a fork in me, pastor. I'm done. As I... As I began to think about this this morning, I had to think to myself, I wonder how many ministries have abruptly ended because somebody didn't get a word. I wonder how many marriages have failed and ended in divorce because somebody didn't get a word. I wonder how many people have just quit and said, I'm done. I'm not going to serve the Lord anymore. This is too much aggravation. I'm tired of the drama. and I'm tired of the aggravation. I'm just, I'm done. I wonder how many people have quit on God because they didn't stay at an altar and get a word. As I thought about the Lord out there teaching on that boat, Brother Steve, I, I began to wonder to myself, I wonder if the context of what Jesus was teaching about, they were in his background, but when they were packing up their nets, he was in their background, so to speak. And while he's in the background teaching, what was the context of his message? Was he talking about commitment? Was he talking about faithfulness? Was he talking about trust and faith in God? Was he talking about the importance of the word? You see, I don't really know what he was teaching about, but I believe that everything he does, he does for a reason, and he led right up to the very principal idea. And a lot of times God would give a word and then he would illustrate the word. Did you hear me? A lot of times God would give a word and then he would illustrate the word. And so he's up there teaching and I don't know, he might have been teaching about faith, Sister Strickland, and all of a sudden he says, Peter, come here. Come here, son. Peter's distraught and Peter, Peter represents a lot of us. Peter is disgusted. Peter's tired and he is ready to go home. Leave me alone. Have you ever been in a place you're like, just leave me alone? I don't want to be bothered. Turn off the phone. If anybody calls, I don't want to answer. Just leave me alone. I'm having myself a little thing right now. I'm just going to call it thing. I'm having myself a little thing right now. Just I, I'm, I'm disgusted. I'm aggravated. I'm beside myself. I don't want to deal with nobody right now. I'm just done. I'm done. I'm so aggravated. I'm, you know, whenever you get like that, you say some of the silliest things. You say some of the craziest things. You come up with some of the fo most foolish stuff. I just can't believe this. Well, I don't know too many people that have not been in that place. And I want you to know right now, as sad as this is, I shared this with you recently. But I have numerous pastors and friends of mine and people that are in leadership that I have spoke to directly 
who are going through one of the greatest storms of their entire life and ministry right now because we're in a time and an age of the church when nobody seems to know or understand the complexity but the importance of faithfulness to God, to the house of God, to to the ministry. Hardly anybody you see anymore. You still got a few remnants of people that try to be supportive of ministry and you'll have somebody here and somebody there who will stand up, oh yes, we're behind the church and that sort of thing, but we've got ministers and preachers and pastors and people that are uh, just a few uh, weeks back one pastor very prominent man who had reached thousands and thousands of people had a huge ministry and all of that he took his own life you know why because he got to the place that he felt like he was given everything that he had and he finally got to a place he said I'm tired of feeling like I've got nothing I'm tired of feeling like I'm putting forth all the right effort but I'm getting nothing in return But how many of you remember this morning? I'm going to try to close on this thought. How many of you remember whenever, and I've preached this before, this is no new thing, but you remember whenever Elijah's servant, he sent him to the top of Mount Carmel. And you remember what he asked him? What do you see? And you know what the man said? Nothing. Do you know that whenever Naaman came, for healing from his leprosy. And Elijah said, go dip down in in the muddy Jordan River. And he got all beside himself. Well, not a barn and far from some rivers of Damascus. Can I go dip down over there? Come on, ain't there a better way than this? Can I get a bigger church than this? Can I get more love than this? Can I get a bigger offering than this? You know what I'm saying. And he goes over there. And you know that We know the end of the story that he dipped seven times down in Jordan like the man of God told him to, but whenever he came up the first time, what did he? Nothing. Nothing. When he came up the second time, do you know how many times that I have watched as a pastor, I have pampered and I've petted and I've burped and I've tried to change people's spiritual diapers and get them going for God, and just about the time they're just about to take off running, Several years ago, I want to share a story with you about a, I may have shared this with some of you before, but there was a couple that I'd ran into when we were doing homeless ministry in downtown Apopka. There was a young, there was a man by the name of Lewis and a lady by the name of Shade. That was her street nickname. She had no legs from a little past her knees. And Lewis had been incarcerated, if memory serves me right, 27 years. Never earned a paycheck in his life. But when we went and did a Thanksgiving homeless outreach ministry in the downtown park of Apopka, he stood off to the side and he stared at me, listening to me. When it was all said and done, he came to me and he said, Preacher, where is your church at? And I said, well, right now we're, we're uh, having church in a house. He said, I don't matter to me. He said, I don't know what it is about you. He said, I ain't never liked a white man in all of my life. He said, but there's just something about you. He said, I want to know where your church is. I didn't know this at the time, but I found out later that he had been a Muslim while in prison. I had no idea. He came to the church where that we had our little house church at. We would have sometimes as many people as we have in this sanctuary in the house. And he gave his life to the Lord. And I remember Lewis would jump up on his feet while I was preaching and he'd say, make it real, preacher, make it real. Still remember him saying that. And boy, he would get in. After a little time went by, we began to talk and he was trying to change his life. He was a bad alcoholic. He was into some drugs and such, but alcohol was his his hang up. And he said, preacher he said I'm trying to kick the habit and I'm trying to quit and I went to Lewis and I said look son I said I want you to do me a favor he said what's that I said if you fall on your face I said if you try to quit and you run for three or four weeks and you ain't drinking no alcohol and you fall flat on your face I said I don't want you to run from me I don't want you to run from the church and I don't want you to run from God I said, get back up and run again. He said, but preacher, I don't want to fail God and this and that and the other. And I said, you know what? I don't condone. If you fail God, I won't condone it. 
I said, but the worst thing you can do is fall on your face and say, well, I just can't do it and just quit. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, Lewis, what if you run for two months straight, clean as a whistle? You fall into sin and you get up and you look at yourself with disgust and say, no use in trying and you leave, you go the other way. I said, but what if you get back up and next time you run for three months or the next time after that you run for six months? He said, okay, I feel you, preach. I feel what you're saying. I said, I want to see you make it. I said, I'm more concerned about your soul than all the different complications of what people have to say about you and all that. I said, we just want to see you get saved and go to heaven, Lewis. Well, a little while went by and Lewis came to me and he said, preacher, I can't get a job. He said, I've got a record. I can't get a job nowhere. At the time, I was doing the ceilings about 100,000 square feet almost of this Coles right on the corner of 434 and 436. And I told Lewis, I said, Lewis, I don't normally like to mix church and business and all that together because I've seen a lot of things go awry. I said, but I'll give you a job. All you got to do is show up, be my ground man. And I said, keep up with me. So Lewis went to the job. We were on the portion of the job where we were dropping all the ceiling tile. And I I mean, whenever I get in the middle open of those stores, I mean, I am moving. He would run a pallet, a whole pallet of ceiling tile, and he would be giving me tile. I'd go up, put it in, come back down, give me more tile. Lewis worked like a man would work. He worked hard, did a good job. And I remember after a whole week's work, I was paying him about $10 an hour. So at the end of the week, he had, I think, 46 hours, $460 that I was paying Lewis. And I said, Lewis, at the end of the week, hey, man, I, I, I remember sitting in my red pickup truck. We went right downtown Apopka. He told me, he said, there's a store over here that'll let me cash my check. I said, all right. And I remember as he went to get out of my truck, I looked at Lewis and I looked him straight in the eyes and I said, Lewis, can you handle this? And he looked at me kind of puzzled. I said, don't look at me like that. You know what I mean. He said, oh yeah, 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 preach. I'm good, I'm good. I said, all right, buddy. He piled out of the truck, and I didn't see Lewis for, I, I think it was like two months. My wife and I, we were doing the ministry we were doing. We went out. We searched everywhere. I drove all over at Popka, and I happened to know where that his wife's uh, mama lived at. And so we went over to Pine Hills into one location, and we pulled up at Lewis's house, his uh, wife's mother's house, and I got out and I talked to her. And she said, Preacher, if you can help them too. She said, you're doing more than a lot of folks. She said, because ain't nobody been able to help them. They've been on alcohol, on drugs. They walk the streets. They do all this. Said, but I, don't, I know I saw them the other day. I said, you know about where I can find them? She said, you'll probably find them over so and so. Well, later on I ran into Lewis. Lewis wouldn't even look me in the face. I said, Lewis, do you remember what you made a promise to me of? He said, yes, sir. I said, you promised me that if you fell on your face, You wouldn't run from me, run from God, and run from the church. I said, you would get back up. We would deal with it. We don't condone it. I said, but you would run again. He said, yes, sir. I said, Lewis, I still love you even though you fell. God still cares about your soul even though you flopped and fell right on your face. Lewis, get back up and run again. What I'm telling you this morning is simply this. As a child of God, you could easily quit and give up on God. Say, I've tried and I keep coming up with nothing results. So why do I even try? Why do I even bother? What is the use, preacher? I've tried it and tried it and tried it. I've come to tell you this morning, try it one more time. Get back up. Get your net off the shelf. You might have to get that net dirty one more time. You might have to Throw it out in the water and let God show himself mighty. Sometimes you've got to look to God and you've got to say, God, kind of feeling a little bit like Simon Peter right now. And Lord, to be honest with you, I could give you a long list of every reason why I've been working at it and it hasn't worked yet. I can tell you every finance company that denied me. I can tell you every time I applied for food stamps and couldn't get it. I could tell you every time that I came up with nothing 
And I can tell you every time I got so disgusted, there were times when people talked about God, I didn't even want to hear it. My God, I'm talking to somebody this morning. I didn't even want to hear about God. Get out of my face with that. If God really loved me, where was he when this happened? Where was he when that happened in my life? Let me tell somebody, God's been there the whole time. He's either gonna be loved and trusted or he ain't. And if you'll put your trust in him, he'll do more for you and he'll be better by you. Hallelujah. We are standing your feet all across this house this morning. Hallelujah. Sister Miranda, come to the piano quickly this morning and play something, sing something. I want every head bowed and eye closed across this church. You might be here this morning. You may say, Pastor Myers, I've done tried so much and I've come up empty handed, but I want you to be reminded you are not serving an empty handed God. Does anybody feel that down in your bones? Why do I have to leave the lake of Genesaret empty-handed when I'm not serving an empty-handed God? Huh? Think about that a minute. I don't serve a God who's got empty hands. I serve a God that can bless. I serve a God that can heal. Why should I return without nothing in my hands? I've been working at this all night long. There are some people that are content to just labor and toil and labor and toil and never pause long enough to get in an altar and say, Boy, my family sure is going through it and they need and I need a word. Because you know the truth is, sometimes we get frustrated when they only call when they want something. Did I just tell the truth? Yeah. Sometimes it can be so frustrated when the only time they want to talk to you, but sometimes behind that quivering voice is a desperation that says, Grandma, Mama, I've tried everything. The world has left me empty. I'm coming up with nothing. And if Grandma can get in an altar and Grandma can get a word... You see what your children need, what my children need. They need a word. They need a God who can supply their need according to his riches and glory. They don't need another program. They don't need another therapist, another counselor, or somebody to tell them six steps to victory. I'll tell you the greatest step to victory is just simply get down on your face. How many of you are simple-minded enough this morning to say, hey, you know, I've tried the programs and I ain't none the better. I've tried it all like the woman with an issue of blood. I've spent so much money. I've spent it till I ain't got no more money to spend but this morning there's one thing in my heart of hearts I know that if I can trust in God he will make a way amen every head is bowed and eyes closed this morning I'm asking you to consider right this moment are you ready to make the clean break and run for the Lord if you're ready to give your whole heart soul mind strength and body to the Lord I want you to step out of a pew right this morning and I want you to come to this altar and I want you to kneel down and give your life to the Lord right now right here I want. I will promise you one thing. If you'll give your all, you will not have regrets on the day of judgment.